good morning, Grace. I'm sorry to have to interfere with your fellowship this morning. I know that's really sometimes impolite for the pastor to do that, but there's time after the service for that as well. It's just glad to hear life in the, in the body of Christ. Isn't it great? It's okay to clap louder than that. It's all right. We're in the house of the Lord, and he's used to praise, so we can give him more praise than that. Uh, this morning, we are just praising the Lord that we get together again in, in person and online to celebrate this message called Love in the Light, and I hope it touches you in a way that's meaningful for the living of your life. There's a lot we, a lot we can learn about love and the way we express our love to others, the way we uh, bring God's love to others, so that's what today is all about. Let's go to the Lord today in prayer and ask for his blessing. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to open our minds and our hearts today, that you will pour into us the very word that we need to hear, that we might become even better ambassadors for the kingdom. Help us, Lord, to become people who love the way you love. Help us to become people who are filled with grace and mercy and kindness, people who realize that today is a great day, if for no other reason, just because you've given us this very day. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to be present in our life today and always, that we might always be singing your praises to all those around us, whether they know you or not, that they will get to know you by knowing us. This we ask in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing some beautiful and wonderful words. You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling 
Jesus. Jesus. Sing it once more. My heart will sing no other name. Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Let's take our seats and... Uh, Brother Manny, would you read us some scripture? Absolutely. Good Let's morning. Let's welcome Brother Manny back in this morning. So I'm going to ask for a favor, first of all, if I can get the lights up. This new medicine makes me blind. Um, so, yeah, if I can just get a little bit of light. Thank you so much. Uh, there you go. Perfect. All right. So, beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true to in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is the light and he hates his brothers is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because he, the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is the word of the Lord, and we can trust it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now, with the lights up that high, you guys aren't going to be able to sleep during this message. You realize that, right? That's right. Oh, there go the lights back down. <laughs> That's okay. I won't go to sleep up here, and I'll do my best to keep you from doing the same. Now, have you ever heard the phrase, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is? Would you agree that that's a true statement? I would say it almost always is not count, you almost always can count it not being true if it sounds too good to be true, right? That's the norm. There's really a lot of wisdom in that statement. Certainly when you're listening to advertising, you know, wouldn't it be great if all you had to do was to take that little pill and every fault that you ever had is going to instantly disappear. It's just going to go poof, it's gone. And really what's going to disappear is what? Your money. That's all that's going to disappear is your money when you do that. You know that when you watch those shows, but all right, watch that advertising. But after a while, you think, well, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about that. Isn't it worth just $19.95 to find out? And I can get two of them so I can share my misery with somebody else. But aren't we thankful that we can trust the promises that God has made? That when he's promised us he's going to do something, he will indeed do it. We don't have to question, we don't have to doubt. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about today because that's really what the book of 1 John is all about. So, so to give you just a little bit of background on the book itself, John wrote this letter because John knew that we needed to get it right. And he was concerned about the, the false teaching in the church. Did you know there was false teaching? There has been false teaching in the church, oh, from the beginning till now. And guess what? It's going to continue until Jesus comes back. And guess what most of the false teaching is? Telling people what they want to hear. The tickling of the ears. Something that says, all I have to do is, is proclaim it and it will be mine. If I, if I claim that I'm going to be rich, I'm going to be rich. If I claim I'm going to be six feet tall, I'm still going to be short. And, well, but you get, you get the point. I mean, at some point, you can claim it and it's just not real, right? But that's not what some people would have you believe, is that, okay, if you think that, that, your what, if, that your follicles are challenged, your hair is falling out, that all you have to do is take a pill and it'll be fixed. If you think that all you, you have too much weight on you, so all you have to do is take a pill, or you can watch a video, and it's going to take care of that for you. Well, remember what I said about your money leaving? Well, that's what's going to leave, is your money. But Scripture says a lot more about the way we're supposed to live and we're supposed to believe, and we're supposed to believe in the truth from the teller of truth and then be able to identify who the teller of lies is. And the teller of lies is always Satan. And Satan will always be present, always ready to give you a doubt. Should I or shouldn't I? 
Because that's how Satan works. It starts off as that little itty bitty doubt, and then it grows from there. But we can count on God's promises each and every time. So it's important that we really know that, we understand that. So here we are in the season of Lent, this preparation for Easter, the empty tomb. And last week, you know, I talked about uh, do you love me or love me, which sounds like I was a little, I was repeating my redundancy, which is not really what was happening because there are different kinds of love, and we talked about that. We wanted to understand the, the kind of love, the agape love that Jesus had for us and how we're supposed to apply that to others, how we're supposed to love others in that way. And here Peter was, even with Jesus, and he, Jesus asks him, do you agape love me, this all-encompassing kind of love? And P all Peter can get himself to say is, well, I, I like you like a, I mean, I love you like a brother. So I have a friendly love for you, but I don't have the all-encompassing love for you yet. But Jesus still put Peter in charge of the church. Don't forget that. He still put Peter in charge of the church. And today the message is titled, Love in the Light. And I want us to get closer to loving the way God loves others and loves us is how we're supposed to love those around us, right? So that's in the light. Let's start off by getting the full setting of, uh, for 1 John. In 1 John 2, 1, My little children, I'm writing these, these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, this is very foundational for us who believe in Jesus because we need to understand that, that if, when we sin, and we will sin, that there is an advocate for us. So what does this advocate mean? It's not, that, by the way, this is not a nutritional supplement, right? That's a little different. This advocate, the word that's used there is actually parakletos, which is in, in Greek means one summoned to one side. So someone who's called to be, come alongside and to aid you. One who pleads another's case in front of a judge. That's what that word means. So when you read this passage, what he's really saying is Jesus is, is there to come alongside us and to plead our case for us before the judge. He's a pretty good attorney to have on your side when you've done something wrong. Because all he has to do is say, no, I've got that. I take his sin upon me. That's what Jesus does because he's already paid the price for our sin. What a great advocate. I don't think it works that way down at the county courthouse. <laughs> so he, had, he, had, he shows his agape love by being the one to stand next to us, come along next to us and say, I'm going to stand in place of this person. I'm going to receive the penalty. I've already received the penalty, in fact, that this person should receive for the, pen, for the sin that they've committed. And in 1 John 2 and following, John reminds us that Jesus already sacrificed for our sin. We don't have to do that anymore, and, but we are supposed to still keep his commandments. That's what he says in the beginning of this chapter. And then we come to, to verses 5 and 6 in chapter 2 of 1 John. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected by the way we know that, that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Wow. Wouldn't it be great if people would say that, that when they think of you, that you are actually the perfection of God's love? Pretty awesome. I mean, can you imagine God looking at you and saying, you, ha you are a perfect image of my love the way you pour it out to those people around you. Clearly, he's not checked my Facebook page. <laughs> but wouldn't that be great? And wouldn't it be great if he could say that about the church? And say that the church has done everything perfectly in the eyes of God that is a perfect reflection of his grace Mercy and peace. Wow. And I don't mean just Grace Church. I mean his entire church. Well, Psalm 56, 13 gives us a, a great demonstration that we need to think about. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Now, just know a couple of things. That because Jesus sacrificed for our sins, that we might have, that we might actually be delivered from, from eternal death. And he has done that, right? We agree that we've learned that. He's done that. We know it's true. We know that light is eternal life. We know that darkness is eternal death. Doesn't sound like a good place to go. And believers in Jesus, as the Son of God, are called the people of light. We're supposed to be the people of light. So let me ask you. If you are the people of light and you go into your bathroom and you close the door and you don't have any, or you put blinds over the windows or close the window, 
and you turn the light off, do you look like people of light? Or do you look like it's in a dark room? It's a real question, not a rhetorical question. Which is it? Well, obviously, you would turn the light off, it would be a dark room, right? Because there is no light that will emanate from you. Because we're not talking about physical light, we're talking about eternal light. So when you walk into a dark room because people are negative and they're sad and they're, they're fearful, do you bring the light with you or does the room stay dark? If you go into a room and there's still gloom and doom by the time you finish walking in the room, it means you are not bringing the light of Christ with you into that room. That's all there is to it. So how many of us honestly can say that we intentionally and knowingly bring the light of Christ into every setting we go into? We should get kicked out of more places. And I'm serious. We should go into more settings where people are all gloom and doom, and they should be just wanting to get rid of us because they can't tolerate the light. That's when we're being the people of the light. When they just look at us and think, wow, man, that's just too intense happy. That, that, that I don't understand how they could how they could face what we're going through and realize and see, and see anything good out of it. I don't see how they can how they can think that way. How they can't be consumed by the darkness. Well, the way we know that is because we know that when we follow God's commandments, we're not going to stumble. And if others don't, if others will follow God's commandments, they won't stumble either. So we help them to not stumble when we help them to not not fail in the commandments. Right? That's what Scripture pretty much says. Now, understand that at the beginning of, of verse 7, when he addressed beloved, he uses that term, he's talking about the agape love group, okay? So this agape love group, he's saying that I love you guys so much. That's who he's referring to. So he's saying my beloved, and I could refer to you as my beloved. I love you that much. But understand this is coming from John who was known as what? He was known as the apostle of love. Nobody calls Pastor Adam the pastor of love. But that's what they called John, the apostle of love. But do you know what else they called John? Because, you know, you could easily say, well, you've always, he was just made that way. Some people are made to be nice and sweet, and they're just known for love, right? Well, let's look what the Scripture says, Mark 3, 17, when they're referring to him. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, guess what they were called? The sons of thunder. Huh? The sons of thunder became, one of the sons of thunder became the apostle of love? Yes. So if you have anger management issues and you say, that's just always the way I am. God made me that way. That's the way I'm going to be, and you just have to deal with it. How many of you thought you were looking in the mirror just now? Or, I'm sorry, for someone else in another house, another church. But if you think that, that you just can't be any different because that's how God made you. God made John, the son of thunder, into John, the apostle of love. How did he do it? By the power of the Holy Spirit. So we cannot hide behind the tag that somebody else puts on us, the name tag, the nameplate, the label that says that, oh, you're ADD, you've got anger management, whatever the, the strip is, you don't have to live by that. You live by what the Holy Spirit blesses you with. Let the Holy Spirit change you, and He will. God is capable. If He can take the Son of Thunder and turn Him into the Apostle of Love, He can change you too. And then we get to 1 John 2, 7, where we hear about this new commandment that's really the old commandment. Kind of sounds like you're going back and forth, almost sounds like you're a politician. You know, you've got to vote for it before I know whether I can vote against it kind of thing. Well, it's the same kind of thing because you need to understand that in the beginning and later, we get the same discussions, okay, about this commandment. So take a look at Leviticus 19. In case you don't know, Leviticus is pretty close to the beginning of the Bible, right? Really close. And in verse 17, it says, you shall, not have, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur the sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. <laughs> don't hate. The bottom line is don't hate. And there's not an escape clause here. There's nothing that says don't hate unless it says do not hate. Very clearly. We've got to reason frankly with our neighbor. What does it mean to say we reason frankly? It means that you have to be honest. You have to be truthful, but you also have to be kind, loving, and merciful. 
Talk about a tough balance to achieve. When someone you're speaking with, you just know in your heart of hearts that they are so far off center, they're so far off right. How in the world do you reason frankly with them when they don't seem to want to reason? And the answer is that you do your part and pray for the rest. We don't, get to, we don't get to decide the outcome. We just get to decide what we do. So it's important that we do that. And usually we'll just, we'll just simplify that and say, well, it says we're supposed to love your neighbor, and, and we kind of stop right there, but we don't really spend a lot of time with what precedes that in the passage, and it's really important. And then we come to the New Testament under Matthew twenty two thirty six. This is a little longer, but listen to what this says. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. All of it, not one of those. You don't, it's not multiple choice. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You see, not only do we have to love our neighbor, we have to love our neighbor as ourself, Right? But we have to love as Christ loved. We get that in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you that the love, love one another just as I have loved you. Um, you also are to love one another. By this, the people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We can't just love one another because we like them. We have to really love them the way God loves us. It's important that we do that. And it's time for us to really kind of take off the gloves. Let me just tell you, I'm going to get into a little bit of meddling. It's what I do as a pastor. It's what I'm supposed to do. And some may say that they don't like it because it's meddling. Well, it's meddling, and that's what preachers do. But it's the heart of the gospel. And the heart of the gospel is we, there's no room for us to hate other people. None. We can't afford to let that happen. You see, the culture we live in is headed down a very dangerous path. A very dangerous path. And we as believers in Christ, we are the people of light and we cannot be in one hand people of light and also fail to speak up when there is darkness. You can't do that. It's not possible to be both. So as I read the desire for some people to rename our gender references and remove gender references from documents, for instance, and to actively allow people to decide at any given point, on any given day, whether they're male or female or what they now call fluid, which means they go back and forth. When I hear that, and when I hear that there's an attempt to use tax dollars to provide abortions and, and, and to do gender reassignment surgeries, I think, oh my gosh, I'm having a really hard time hearing that and being neutral. And I have a really hard time understanding how it is that we as Christians can allow the government to start telling us as Christians what we get to preach and what we get to believe that comes straight from our Bible. That's not biblical, and quite honestly, it's not constitutional. But each one of us have a tremendous obligation that regardless of what the thing is that makes us uncomfortable or that we don't like, whether it's because of, of gender assignment stuff or whatever it is, because we're supposed to love everyone regardless and not sit in judgment over them because of their choices, their lack of knowledge, their lack of faith. We don't get to judge them for that. When we judge others that way, then we are no better off than any other terrible sinner. In fact, we are probably worse because we bring a mark against our faith. We must love more and judge less. That is absolutely the requirement. Yet we cannot remain silent when there are teachings that come out that are not consistent with what Scripture says. Scripture is really clear to me anyway that life begins when God says life begins. When God created us, He created a life, and that was a created life, not an accidental part of an explosion. I honestly believe that. I believe the Scripture teaches us that. And I believe that babies are alive in God's eyes from the time He creates them, from the, the, first, the first division of cells is easily the time you can say that we have absolute life. So we should protect that life. So do I, I'll, I'll just tell you, if you haven't figured it out yet, I get a little closer to Son of Thunder when we talk about protecting babies, okay? 
And I get, I get really close to being a son of thunder when I hear that they're wanting to do, you know, gender reassignment surgery as early as, as eight. Eight years old. I didn't have any clue when I was eight. I, I mean, please, eight years old? I didn't, don't think I even liked macaroni and cheese yet. <laughs> so I'm really glad something relatively permanent didn't happen to me then. We shouldn't be messing with God's design in that way. But regardless of that, regardless of the difficulty I have loving someone who thinks it's okay to, to terminate a pregnancy because of finances or inconvenience, because I have trouble with that, I still have to love that person even more. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It, do, it means if it's an abortion provider, I still have to love them and pray for them even more. You know, we're in the middle of the 40 days of life, and I hope you're, you're joining me in prayer for that. We have people in San Antonio out, out in front of the Planned Parenthood Clinic just praying for people, praying for decisions for life to be made. In fact, Tuesday is a good opportunity for you to go down and join them. We've got folks from our community that are going to be there, and we'd love to see more there. But I'm here to talk about how we love in the light. Not to just say there's darkness. It'd be real easy to talk about all the things that make us hurt or upset or fearful because of changes in our society or changes in the culture or whatever. But that is not helpful. What is helpful is to bring the light of Christ into whatever circumstances we find ourselves. So how do we actually do that? See, I've got to live but through the obedience of Leviticus 19.17, right? I can't, like, cross that off, which really means that if, if, if I get wound up in anger and hatred, then the sin of the other party comes on top of me. Then I'm the one sinning, and I know better. So how can I know the Scripture, know the love of God, and then accept the sin of being angry with someone else because they don't fully understand what God has to say about life? No, it's my job to, sh to share with them what God has to say about life. It's my job to show them what real love looks like. I can't walk away from that. So here's a question for you. Does God love abortion? No. Does God love abortion providers? Yes. Absolutely. So does God love those who have sought an abortion or had an abortion? Absolutely. He loves all of us regardless of our sin, and we all have sinned. So we need to get over that, pray for people who they are. Now, Romans 5.8 has this, has this very, very key word in it. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Guess what? He didn't wait for us to quit sinning and then start loving us. Jesus went to the cross before I was born. He knew I was going to be a sinner. He already loved me then. And he knew all the sins I was going to ever commit. But he still loved me. So we don't get to, we don't get to hide behind that or, or say, well, it's too late for me. No, that's not true. He died for us while we were sinners. He still did that. He wasn't waiting for us to come around. So what is it that lets us think that it, with the people in our family or our friends, our circle of friends, that we have to wait for them to come around before we start extending our love, grace, and mercy to, the, to these people? It's not biblical. We love them first and we love them through. You love them first and you love them through. That's what we have to do. Now, we know the darkness is real, right? I mean, the darkness in the world is real. It's, it's obvious. I think it's even more prevalent every day. But without knowing the goodness of God, we cannot possibly even know really what the darkness is. And John 8, 12 said, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not, fo will not walk in darkness, but will have light, the light of life. Well, of course he said that. He is the light. So if we have Jesus, we have the light. And if we have the light, we don't have to worry about the darkness. But you've got a perpetual flashlight, and it's brighter than an LED any day. But if we are, as Christians, are the epitome of gloom and doom, we're going to have a problem because we're not going to convince anybody else that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life if we're walking around as if we are in darkness, carrying darkness with our own personal cloud over our head. We should be rejoicing that God has given us this promise of salvation regardless of what happens here. We are saved. We know we are. So we've got to love our brother. That's what he says, is to love our brother. In 1 John 2.10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. Now, 
abides. What do you mean by abides? It means, it means a permanence. Of staying. So we're staying with. So we stay with God and then we don't stumble. That's what it's saying. Let the light of Christ in you always 